Hello and welcome to Me, The Wife and Wrexham AFC. A weekly podcast and YouTube channel where we discuss all things Wrexham AFC from the point of view of long-term fans and new fans. So sit back, put your feet up, relax and let's get stuck in. Hello and welcome to episode 72 of me, the wife and Wrexham AFC. You okay? I'm feeling a bit poo. Oh, yeah. bless you. Let's crack on. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start with the news first. I choked a little bit. That was instant karma that was, it wasn't was it? instant karma. <laughs> Excuse me. Right, we're going to start with the news. I've got something to start with. Okay. I need to make an apology to... Um, to some people and organisations. <laughs> so last week we talked about the new Macron exclusive range, oh, didn't right, okay, we? Yeah. And um, I've been, me and Sean's brother, I, bl- I blame Sean's brother a little bit for this, but I, I'll take it on the chin as well. Um, we were looking at um, some of the products on the Macron website and we found a, a gilet and a coat that looked very much like the um, uh, the the Wrexham exclusive range. Yeah, they were a lot cheaper than the Wrexham products. So we talked last week about how Macron was selling them a lot cheaper when they had the Wrexham badge on in the Wrexham shop. They're a lot more expensive. It turns out that's absolute rubbish. That is not true. We were looking at the wrong gilet and the wrong coat. Um, so the gilets, the coats, and everything that are sold on the Macron website without the Wrexham branding are the exact same price. So that is just an apology. Whenever I'm wrong... So we should blame Macron rather than the club these days. You know, everyone was blaming pricing. the club. I know, yep. I know. And when I'm, when I'm wrong, I'll put my hand up and say, look, I was wrong. I got it wrong. And that, that just so everyone's got the absolute correct information. We've actually... We went, we went into the club shop um, on Saturday um, and we saw some of the bits... We did. And They're actually quite nice in person, you know. I've still got an issue with the price because yeah. it's Macron. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I have got to say, and I've got to take my hat off, that the stuff is actually really nice. Mm-hmm. It's really nice. The coat, the most expensive item, the coat, is a really nice it coat. Is. To be fair, the gilet is really nice. It's all really nice. As it should be for the price that it's been, yes. they're charging for it. But it is really nice. I just wanted to get that out. I'm not going to dwell on it too much because we talked about it last week. But just to put the record straight about pricing all those people and all that going stuff. for the club, it's actually Macron that set the price. Yeah. And we've just literally... Stuck a badge on it. Not, I don't think they're making any profit on it. Uh, there will be some deal, won't there? They're not buying it at retail price, are no, they? I the guess. Club. Yeah. But I can't see it being much, to be fair. No. Anyway. Yes. Um. So season three of obviously just um last Wednesday the final episode of Welcome to Wrexham uh, was aired. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's been confirmed now. I mean, this is not. I don't. This is no surprise. But season three has been confirmed. Yeah. Um. So obviously, out. You know, if you're at the race course and things, uh, week in week out, you'll you would have seen a lot of the cameras going around. So it was no sh- no shock that there was going to be a third series. Not really, but I think TV is a very fickle thing, especially yeah. streaming services, and just because. There's an assumption something's going to happen, and they start people start filming stuff all the time, and it just gets pulled That's and cancelled. So yeah. you know there's no guarantee, um, but, but it's they, been confirmed. It's been confirmed, so there will be a season three, which is so very uh, exciting. yeah, we're hoping we'll get into that se- uh, that season. Maybe <laughs> we've had a crack of getting into two of them, and we haven't really. No. We've been in lots of shots. Yeah. We've seen us lots of times, but. Ah, oh, well. Anyway, um, two quick things. Uh, so Ben Toza made the EFL Team of the Week last week. Uh, certainly wasn't uh, for this, uh, the performance against uh, Accrington. It was the week before against Gillingham. Not, I'm not going to go at Ben. I was going to say it was everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Just, I'm, just yeah. I, There was no one in that Wrexham team on Saturday who deserved to be in the EFL Team of the Week is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But After the Gillingham it, game. For his performance against Gillingham, he made Team of the Week. Uh, also, Elliot Lee was nominated uh, for EFL, uh, EFL what, League Two Player of the Month. 
Um, he didn't win it. I voted for him. I voted for him as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt Smith won it from Salford. So, yeah. well done, uh, I suppose. Well, yeah, whatever. Um, robbed. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely robbed. robbed. So, let's talk about Saturday's game against that Creighton. Do we have to? Because, like, it was awful. I think we're in quite a privileged position uh, when we do this podcast because more often than not, I mean, we get to talk about the team either performing really well, maybe not performing great, but winning, mm. uh, coming back from three, two or three goals down and yeah. rescuing points right at the end. We're very lucky. And we can't just, when we don't put in a performance and we play yeah. average or, or poor, we can't just gloss over it. Are we going to talk about the game as much as we normally would? Probably not, to be honest. There's really much to talk about, is Th there? There really? isn't. No, there's a few key points in there that, but a lot of it was sort of praise for Accrington, the way they set up and the way that they did things, which I don't really want to be doing, if I'm honest, you know, sitting here praising other teams. Yeah. So we had Jordan come in, yep. uh, a left wing back. Yep. Um, for anyone who's like, oh, that's a bet, Jordan did actually start his. Uh, sort of career when he was in youth he he did play as a left wing back so yeah. he's not playing in a position that he has never been in before you know it's it, yes he's a midfielder now and he plays in the middle but it's not something he's never done before and and you know he, he came in to cover because obviously we didn't have James McLean uh, who'd been called up for international duty. He wasn't due to be no. with the Ireland team. He was going to play in the game uh, against New Zealand. The friendly game, in yeah. In the, the midweek. He wasn't due to be in the squad um, uh, for the for the weekend game, but due to injuries, he got called up. Um, Mendy had all, obviously already been called up uh, to the Gambia squad, uh, made it to the bench. Well done. Uh, but no, decent, because he didn't even make the squad last time. He got called up for the initial squad, but didn't make it into the yeah. match day squad. So one step up. Congratulations! It's just, yeah, it is a step in the right direction. Uh, hopefully for you, next time you get a little bit of game third time. Third time lucky. Third time lucky. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So so Jordan came in as left wing back. Um, did all right. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't. I don't think. I think they went after him early, mm. Jordan, because they looked and they went. He doesn't normally play there, and a lot of their stuff came down the right hand side, which is natural really i think that's what anyone would yeah. do you know yeah. you'd go after the person who doesn't normally pay in that position mm -hmm. so that wasn't that was a but i thought he acquitted him himself well yeah uh, he was a lot better going forward than he was defending mm -hmm. which you would expect for an attacking midfielder who that that is his sort of bread and butter but i thought he did all right how do you reckon bryce feels in situations like this probably a bit peeved to be honest I would imagine so. I mean, you know, you're sat, you're not in the 23-man squad. You are a left-footed wing-back, you know, that can play on the left or the right. And mm -hmm. when things like this happen, you're sort of sitting there going, if I was in the squad, I'd be playing today. You know, they certainly wouldn't be dragging Jordan back into a left wing-back no. position. They'd no. be playing the recognised mm. left-sided defender. So it must be quite difficult for him. Um we had Dalby up front with Mullin. Um, they, like I said, they came after us early. They pressed high. They, they, they had good intensity. The pitch for me looked really narrow. Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes really hard to tell, I think. It looked narrow. I think maybe it looked narrow because of how close the stands are to yeah. the sidelines. Yeah. Um, and I don't think the camera ha angle helps either because you know if you've got a high camera angle you can see the whole pitch and you can see that it looks quite expansive and big yeah when you've got a low camera angle it's quite hard to tell and there's you know. bits that we couldn't see as well like yes. the um so obviously where the camera was to the right of the camera um the corner um obviously there was an issue with uh ben tozer and, and a accrington player which nobody could see no. watching because it was there's like a barrier not like a fence or a barrier or something i think it was the top part of the stand was I it think. it looked yeah. like a metal fence yeah. But yeah so obviously we couldn't see that so it was a bit yeah it was a bit it's a small ground you know yeah. it's it, it's a club who've done really well uh, for anybody who doesn't know about Accrington I'm not going to go into their a complete history but they went out of business uh, a number of years ago 
70s? Don't know their history. I'm, we're not an Accrington podcast, so I don't know. But um, they went out of business. There was a, quite a funny milk advert about Accrington Stanley years ago, Which wasn't it? I remember it? growing up. Yes. Yep. So yep. Um, there was two two kids talking about, uh, me dad said I'm going to play for Accrington Stanley. And the other kids going, Accrington Stanley, who were they? And the other kid goes, exactly. And it was that's quite an iconic advert from our youth. Uh, but that's because... They were a team, they went out of business and they had to claw themselves back mm -hmm. from nothing. Like Phoenix Club, um, you know, that which has happened many times in the past. So they're, they're quite a well-known one for that. Um, so, yeah, uh, the knock-on effect of that is they don't have tons and tons of it's sort of like funds because they've come from nothing, they've progressed through. Yeah. And, you know, they haven't obviously had very wealthy owners, which we're very lucky to have. And they've, they haven't built an infrastructure for lots of fans. The chairman's a bit of an idiot though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did find it a bit odd. So for anybody who doesn't know, uh, prior to the game, Wrexham released a tweet um, stating that Accrington, for whatever reason, had decided to increase the price of the tickets for the Wrexham game by £5 mm -hmm. to what they normally are. So all the Wrexham fans have had to pay £5 extra for tickets uh, when every other club they've played this season at home only paid £20. Mm. Um, now, I'll be honest, that's a very odd time to release that tweet. A very odd time, 30 minutes before kickoff, to sort of, it's almost like you're baiting them a little bit. And it, it just seemed, it did seem like an odd time to release something like that. It's a infamous, people are looking on Twitter about information about the game, yeah. about the lineup. To put something on at that point seemed a bit strange. Uh, the chairman took a bit of um, umbrage, umbrage to it, umbrage? I don't know what the word is. He was annoyed. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, there was a few tweets that came out from him as well. Um, Again, I'm not going to talk about him. Isn't not going to talk about it. No. You know, and, and at one point he said that I think he said that Ryan Reynolds is stirring up a hornet's nest. What he did say was um, he mentioned. Oh, I don't, he, he basically contradicted himself because he was saying, you know, in a cost of, you know, when things are rising, da 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 da, um, and then you've got likes of Ryan and Rob coming in and whatever. Um, but then he's raised his prices by five pound when there's a yeah. when everything else is rising. So yeah, I think he needed to sort of like take a step back and yeah. go, well, what have I done? Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to dwell on it. He's an idiot. I don't want to talk about him. No, I mean he, he did at one point. He said Ryan Reynolds is stirring up a hornet's nest. How does he know it was Ryan that posted it? It was Rex. Uh, yeah, Rex and posted it. Ryan didn't post anything no. about the game yesterday did or, Rob. or prior to the game. No. So. Yeah, so it, again, I think he's just been a bit over the top. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, anyway, anyway. So we had, um, again, well, again, we had Tom O'Connor in defence. Mm. He made a couple of mistakes early on, dwelled on the ball a little bit too... Dwelt? Dwelled? Dwelled. Dwelled on the ball. He looked like a 70s porn star, didn't he? He, d he looked like... <laughs> Yeah, he he it just yeah it was it's an odd yeah. look he's got when going the, on at the moment. As soon as November the thirtieth is round, get that tash off yeah. O'Connor because yeah. it yeah. doesn't suit you, I'm afraid. He, I I did make a comment, so I'm part of a, a Discord group that talk during games and stuff like that. Uh, I can't tell you the name of the group, but um, <laughs> yeah, for um, but I made a comment in that group that he looked I, if he dyed it blonde and got a pet tiger, he would very much look yes. like Joe from from Tiger King. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a lock at the moment. He got caught a couple of times. He did. He went off, didn't he? He dwell in on the ball. Uh, he got caught twice. It could have been a lot worse. Mm. It wasn't. Um, we had Boyle on the bench. Boyle is completely fit. Boyle come on at half time. Um, I, 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 how long we're going to persist with Tom in defence, I, I don't know. It, 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 I find it odd. I find it odd because he's an amazing midfielder. Uh, is not great in defence. Is no, no, he does well, mm. but he is getting caught from time to time. Yeah. And we have got recognised big defenders sitting there waiting to get a game. So I'm not sure what's gone on there. Um, although uh, maybe we're trying to pacify Tom a little bit in the sense of. Um, James and George are playing so well together in the middle. Mm. If you take Tom out, 
there's an argument to say he's not going to play. So are we trying to pacify someone like Tom, who we know bigger clubs have already been looking at? Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's an element of that. That maybe. might be total rubbish. I'm not saying yeah. that's the case. But, you know, when you've got so many top quality players sometimes are you running you're always running not sometimes you're always running the risk of of some of them being annoying yeah <clears throat> so for someone like tom who, who has reportedly had interest from higher up you know in the championship are you trying not to annoy that player too much so, he so then you you end up in a position where you've then got to replace him yeah not saying that's the case just your in your opinion no not even in my opinion just something that came across my mind a well, little bit well it's still an opinion if you've spoken about it yeah anyway <laughs> um yeah so um our first real opportunity was uh lee's header yeah. uh which yeah the keeper save well to be fair to him how lee keeps winning headers confuses me because he's so small well, according to his Wikipedia, he's five foot eleven. You, you are not five foot eleven, Elliot Lee. Get somebody to change your Wikipedia page because it's a lie. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so um, a poor back pass from Accrington in the first half. Mullin had a chance, didn't he? A little bit of a chance. It was out wide. I was dying for him because he's he's got it in his locker. When they played that back pass, the keeper come out. I thought, oh, this looks short yeah. here. I was waiting for him to just swing at it. Yeah. You know, either with his right foot over the keeper, which would have been a little bit awkward. Sorry, I've just had a bacon butty and it's just repeating on me a little bit. Um, so, you know, with his right over the keeper or, you know, with his, something. Yeah. But he tried to take it round the keeper. It was a bit of a heavy touch and nothing really came of it. I just, I just wanted him to swing at it. And have a go because he's he's got the skill for it. Yeah. Just have a have a go, mm. you know. And I, that, I, that, yeah, that was one of the things. Um, James Jones had a bit of a swing and a miss. Um, it was nil nil at half time. It was so scrappy. It was such a scrappy game. And considering I, how they played against Gillingham the week before, when which obviously you said you th on you you personally thought that was one of their best ninety minutes that they played in yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and then to go to like Accrington the following week and I don't play think... the way it was. It was so bizarre. I, it's it's weird. There was no urgency. No. There was no intensity to it. I don't think we did a lot wrong, but at the same time, there was you know when we I was talking with a few people and everyone was saying, "Where's the, where's the urgency? Where's the you know?" There was it just didn't feel like we got going. No. But in League Two, we're going to get games like this. We can't we're, win them all at the end of the day. We're going to play brilliantly one week. Yeah. And then we're going to go away from home on what looks like a tight pitch, not great weather. And that team are going to go, right, we're going to come after you. They're going to press us high. We're not going to be able to settle on the ball. It's going to happen. Mm. And we're going to have, on the face of it, a, a really poor performance. That's going to happen. Yeah. And it's going to happen. This isn't the only time it's going to happen this season. It's going to happen another... Well, hopefully, only another, maybe another five or six times. This is this sort of thing is going to happen. Hopefully, no more than that. But teams in this league generally don't win a seventy, eighty percent of their games. It just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So we have to be content with aiming towards that fifty percent win. You know, as soon as you get to twenty-three wins, you're in the mix. Then you're right up there. You know, teams have been promoted automatically from this league after winning l like uh, 22 games which is less than half mm. it, it's it's just gonna happen it wasn't a good day um i'm gonna blast through there's three minutes into the second half uh actually got a penalty uh, will boyle came off the bench as we said at half time give a penalty away straight away soft um my my view on it is it was soft but at the same time, I don't think you can argue with it. it, it if, if there was VAR, which there's not, mm. that wasn't getting overturned. They, everyone looked at it and went, that's so soft. But he had his arms around him and he went down. So nobody was ever overturning that, whether we've got VAR or not. Yeah. You know, it, it just wasn't. I said, you know, it's, it's really soft, but you can't argue. You just can't. Uh, keep put it away. Um uh, on the hour mark, I said I would take Tozer or Hayden off. Yep. 
and Dalby. Yep. I put four at the back. I would put Bar Par Barmer, Palmer and Bickerstaff on and play three up front. Yep. That's eventually what happened, mm. but did it happen way too late? It's just a natural thing at the moment. And I I don't know when, when we just went in that game. Paul had a chance in the first half where yes, he hit the bar. Yes, he did. If he'd have scored that, I think we're looking at a completely different game. Yeah. But he didn't. And I would have put my house on him scoring that goal. And I know. It was just, yeah, he, he had an off day yesterday. He did. As they all did. Yeah, I know. Um, you know, uh, uh, Conquo made a mistake for 2-0. Yeah. Um, and then I just got bored. Yeah, to be honest, was... at that point, I did get bored because I was watching it and it didn't feel like anything was going to happen. Nothing was going to come up. And uh, it didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I did say, at the end of the game, they added 10 minutes on, didn't they? Oh. And I said, they might, they could put another zero on the end of that. It could be 100. And still nothing. We, we would still not score. Um, and just to compound everything, uh, we got a penalty at the end. I was sat there watching it and just going, he's going to miss this. I, it just, it was just one of them days where you go, nothing's going to go for us. We've finally got a chance to score. Uh, he's just going to miss. It and just I just off the whole. It did, and game, it just yeah. felt so apt that. He would yeah. miss that penalty to, cause to go with everything else surrounding that game. And I just knew he was going to miss. I did. And he did. I, d I did. And he, he did. did. Yes. Um, look, we deserve nothing and we got nothing. That, that, that is the mantra for the, for the game. Deserve nothing, got nothing. Yeah. You know, because if you deserve something in a game and you come away with nothing... You sort of feel, you used to feel hard done to. It's really hard to take. Although I don't like losing, yeah. Saturday was not hard to take no. because we didn't deserve anything out of that game. So no. it's very hard to take when you play out your skin and somebody scores a last minute goal or it just doesn't go for you, but you hit the post, you hit the bar, you hit, you know, and, and you do all these things and you just, it's chance after chance and it just won't go for you. Saturday wasn't one of them. It didn't feel like that. It sort of felt like we did just didn't deserve anything. Yeah. So it felt a little bit easier to take for me. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, I was going to ask you for Man of the Match, but no one. The mascot? The mascot. But who it is? <laughs> no, I, I, no. There was, there was nothing, no, was there? I can't. I can't. It's very hard to give um, to give anyone man of the match because I, I'm not sure. You know, everyone had spells of looking quite good, but it just it, didn't come together. Did it, it didn't come together for anyone. No. I don't think it'd be fair to give a man of the match out. I got my prediction right. Uh, just to let everyone know, I went for two nil, um, which was correct. You all right with me having that? Yeah. No. Why not? Because you didn't ask, you didn't want Accrington to win. I didn't want them to win, but I no. didn't state who was going to win no. two 0 I just said two 0 it's, it's an unwritten rule. I'm joking. I'm not. Well, it. good because you're not having it. Um, well, uh, quick chat. But welcome to Wrexham. Yeah. So the finale uh, was last week, as yes. we already know, it's been renewed for a third season. Very emotional. Yeah. What did you What did you make of it? Um, I don't think they showed too much of the game because they what they did was they were sort of like um they had like flashbacks didn't they to like it, it was like it was weird so they were you know it was focused on like Paul Mullen for example um and then it would like do this weird noise and oh. then it would go back to when he was talking yeah. about his son and stuff like that and then with a few other players as well um so it didn't really focus on the game I mean the bit I suppose the bit at the end where you know Everybody charged onto the, you know, the final whistle went at the Borenwood game, um, and everybody just charged onto the pitch. And I, I suppose that is the point, and obviously the parade as well. Yeah. I guess that's the point that people, I, I don't know, did people want to see that or did they want to see the final? I don't know. It's it's a weird one. There, I mean, their documentary made it felt rushed to me. Yeah. It did feel rushed. 
I didn't understand the Notts County interviews mm -hmm. as part as part of that um, uh, as part of that episode. Yeah, because it didn't have nothing to do with Notts County, did it? I, I get the whole. Like, yeah, I, I I get it. Fight to the end thing. Yes, but, but I, I, I I'm not sure that was the episode that it should have been in. It should have been in the Notts County. Episode. In the Notts County episode, exactly. <laughs> yeah. it, it just didn't feel like it fit mm. in that episode. For I, It just it was a little bit odd. As a standalone couple of minutes, I quite enjoyed listening to what Bostock had to say and Luke Williams had to say. I, I enjoyed that, you know, as, uh, to, to, to hear that. And fair play to him for doing it. But I, I, it just didn't fit in that episode. The whole thing seemed very rushed to me. There was hardly any of the parade at the end, and I didn't want to see another 10 minutes of the parade. It just felt it had a rushed feel to it. Um, I it felt like it was a Notts County, you know, it was it was not the promotion episode, which everybody's been, like, waiting for for weeks. Yeah, it just... And then to have, like, like you said, like... So much time spent on Notts County players and the manager and stuff like that. It's like it just seemed a bit. It seemed a bit odd. I think that would have been fine as a conclusion to the season. Hearing from the Notts County players, I feel that would have been fine if the episode itself was a, another fifteen minutes long. Mm. But when you when you feel that the episode's rushed. You start looking at other elements of that episode going, well, why is that in there? Yeah. That didn't need to be yeah. in there. And I think that's why. I think if the episode was another 15 minutes long... Maybe it would have been okay. I think it would have been fine. Yeah. And it was probably, if you think about it, another 15 minutes, 20 minutes on top of that episode, that was probably the perfect time to put the Notts County stuff in right at the end. And maybe not so much on the Notts County episode, but right at the mm. end, it probably made a bit more sense. But because of all the elements put together it just didn't feel just right didn't fit. no yeah. it didn't so we're really looking forward to season three very excited for that one hopefully um, we will be celebrating uh promotion again that would be really nice yeah and I... then season four celebrate again season five celebrate again and then we'll get to season uh 10 um, when we are uh, lifting the Champions League for the third time in a row, maybe. Oh, yeah. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, we've got a guest. We do. We have a guest. Um, so um, David is joining us on the show today. Um, now, I'm not going to say too much about David. I'm going to ask a couple of questions and it will become clear who David is uh, from that. Uh, uh, although, if you're watching on YouTube or You've read the description on YouTube or on the podcast itself. You already know who David is, so it's not really a big reveal. But anyway, um, welcome to the show, David. How are you? Doing great here this Saturday morning. Thanks thanks for having me on. Not a problem at all. So, David, um, so three questions in one. Where do you live now? Where are you from? And what is your connection to Wrexham? Okay, well, I live in the United States. I live in a, a small town called Indian Trail in North Carolina, which is just outside Charlotte, the bigger town. Um, we moved here, my wife and myself and family moved here uh, 26 years ago, 1997. Um, and we lived in Wrexham and we lived there for over 30 years. Um, I was actually born in Hull in uh, England. Um, my father was a football manager, a football player, sorry. And forgive me if I actually say soccer because I've had 26 years of Americanism here. Um, but he was a, a football player for Hull City. That's where he started his career. Um, and then we moved around to various clubs, uh, the biggest one being Aston Villa. Um, and then uh, he finished his career at South End United. Um, at which point, when he finished his career after a small time working at Ford's and also gaining his um, coaching badges and medical football badges, he got the offer of being the physio at Wrexham Football Club. Never been to Wales. I was, I think I was about 10 years old at the time. So uh, I remember my mom and dad actually coming and saying, hey, we're going to move to Wrexham. I said, where? <laughs> but anyway, many years later... Here I am supporting them still. And, and my father became uh, the physio for a couple of years under a manager called Alvin Williams. And then uh, after Alvin left, he was asked to become caretaker manager. 
And 10 years later, he was still the caretaker manager. And he always said to me, he said, because they had nobody else better, he said, I got the job. So I said, well, that's great. <laughs> so the, my connection with Wrexham is my father was probably one of the longest serving managers of Wrexham Football Club back in the 70s, beginning at 68 to, I think it was 77. Well, it was 77. So yeah, yeah that's, that's my connection. I mean, for, for anybody who doesn't know by now, uh, uh, it's uh, David's dad was was John Neal, who uh, basically is, uh, as as David rightly said, he was manager from sort of 68 to 77. Um, and it is probably, um, it, he's very well loved, a legend of Wrexham um, and uh, po possibly the most, one of the most underrated managers in Wrexham history in the sense of when we talk about legends, uh, his name always comes up. But there are other names that sort of pop up before him. And I, I, I think he was probably one of Wrexham's best ever managers for what he actually did to the club. So we're, he won the uh, the fourth division title. Uh, which was the League Two, League Two, if we're talking about, um, you know, because obviously there's been a, a bit of a change with with names of leagues. Um, he had uh, he took Wrexham into Europe in the Cup Winners' Cup, um, most famously, I think, against Anderlecht. Um, so quarterfinals of the Cup Winners' Cup, um, we lost to Anderlecht. Um, and this was before I was born, but I, I know the stories. And um, Anderlecht actually went on to win the competition. Um, there was a few FA Cup giant killings in there. I think Tottenham was one, um, you know, back in, back in the day. And um, he, 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 as David said, he left us in uh, 1977 um, and went to Middlesbrough, uh, basically. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, great, a great manager. And for me, one of the greatest managers that we've ever had, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it like having a dad as a football player and then he became obviously a manager? What was it like having a dad doing those jobs? Well, it was funny as a, a, Sean, as a football player, it, it was quite good because it, he played for the Villa, for Aston Villa. And at the time, Aston Villa were... In the well, they started off when they were in the second division or the championship as we know it today. And the first year he was there, he was transferred from Swindon Town to Aston Villa. First year he was there, they actually won promotion to Division One or as we know it, the Premiership. So Aston Villa in those days were playing in front of 70,000 people. You know, you look at the, the crowds of the grounds. We talked, we played Port Vale the other day. Well, Aston Villa, my father was playing in the FA Cup game at Port Vale that actually today hold the attendance, which was 65,000 people in Port Vale. Today, you know, they won't even hold that any longer. So um, it's, it, was, it was really neat. Having said that, I was only, when he was at the Villa, I was only six years old and seven years old. But uh, I'll tell you a quick story, if you don't mind, about when he was at the Villa, totally different to what it was today where you get the premiership players that are on, on hundreds of thousands of dollars a, a, a week or whatever it may be. My dad, Villa, and, and every other professional player in the premiership or the division one was not on good money. In fact, during the summer, he didn't get paid. So what he did, he had to get a second job. And he was um, he became a, a pop deliverer, a, a, a truck and... He delivered pop. So as a six-year-old, to have a dad who was a professional footballer in the top league in the world, yeah, okay. To have a dad who actually delivered pop, wow, that was absolutely great. So, you know, things have changed. Can you imagine today someone like Salah or Harlan or someone like that delivering pop? Uh, I don't think so. You can't even imagine Paul Mullen or any of those doing that in the summer. But that's what used to happen, you know, until probably the set, uh, mid 60s, 70s. They were getting paid very little and you know, in front of 70,000 people. It was, it was amazing. So was it neat? Yeah, well, it was it was good. We moved about a lot. We went, I say, we went from Hull to Kings Lynn to Swindon Town, Aston Villa, South End, And then we ended up in, in Wrexham. And, uh, we spent, my wife and I spent here 30, uh, sorry, in Wrexham, 30 years of our lives there. Had, had our children there and whatever. But uh, 
But then he, my father was manager. And when we got married, he he actually that was the same year as he was moved as he moved to Middlesbrough. In fact, my wife and I had to get married on a Friday because Middlesbrough were playing Manchester United on the Saturday. And funnily enough, the uh, um, we were going on our honeymoon, Stratford upon Avon, uh, on the Saturday. We were listening to the game, and um, Middlesbrough won two one. But they scored in the 90th minute. And interestingly enough, the goal scorer was Billy Ashcroft, who he took from Wrexham. So there we go. How about that for a coincidence? It's a great story. Yeah, that is a, that is a great story. Imagine having to get to get married on a Friday. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a footballer thing, though, isn't it? Yeah. You know, getting I think married we, on... Well, we did get married on a Thursday, but I think if we were... It's because it was cheaper. Well, yeah. But, yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think we probably would have had to say... I, obviously, you mentioned there that y your dad went from Wrexham up to Middlesbrough, you know, up to the sort of northeast where he was sort of from. Uh, and, you know, it was a Division One club. You know, it, 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 it's obvious what the draw was to, to move to that. Do you do you think, though, obviously, with the very next the team that he built went on in 77, 78 to be to be champions and to be promoted? And I know he, he's, you know, he, he he did his thing at Middlesbrough. Do you think there was any slight tinge of regret from him that he would left when he did, or do you think he was completely happy that he'd gone at the the right time? He had a lot of regret, and and the regret was, I don't know whether you understood that why he left, but during the season that we didn't go up when we played Crystal Palace and Mansfield, those last two games, which by the way, last season for Wrexham. I could see that happening again, where they lost the last two games and didn't go up. But at the end of the season, the the chairman of Wrexham, who his name was Fred Tomlinson at the time, he was a he was from Rosset. He was a dairy farmer. Uh, I remember my father was on the field on the pitch with him after the games where they were talking about the the game, and he actually said that he had refused an offer from Aston Villa to approach my dad to become manager. Well, my dad is an Aston Villa ex-player. His prim premium job would have been to manage Aston Villa. And that really upset him. And he said, look, I can't work for somebody like this who won't even tell me or give me the opportunity. So Middlesbrough at the time were losing Jack Jackie Charlton and they came in for him. And so that's the reason he left. I, I think he may have had a a thought about staying because the team that was being built and to be fair, Arvin Griffiths took Wrexham up, not, not my dad. So, you know, Arvin did one or two tweaks, which made a big difference. Um, I think he would have liked to have stayed. He always loved Wrexham um, because Wrexham gave him his first opportunity in, in football. Um, and you don't get that today. You know, he was one of the longest serving managers for Wrexham. He was one of the. He is the longest serving manager for Chelsea, which uh, yeah, I think they mainly last six months now. But uh, yeah, so you know, he appreciates people that give him the chance. And, you know, when he went to Chelsea, Ken Bates was uh, the chairman, and he went through some hard times. The first year, they nearly got relegated to the third division, and um, Ken Bates said, "No, we're going to keep," and and he did, and they got rewarded for it at the end. So. You know, he, he he loves loyalty, but for the chairman to actually say to him that Aston Villa had approached him and and he refused, I think that was kind of a little bit of, a, a bit too far for him. So that's why they moved to Middlesbrough, and you're right. He's a northeastern. My mom was from Newcastle, and my dad was from Sunderland. Can you believe that? You know, mm -hmm. and um, that, yeah, so they went to Middlesbrough, and they had four good years there, although that, that out of the three clubs, that was the one that was a little sour, because of um, the, the again the chairman wanting to sell his best players, so there we go. You mentioned you mentioned Chelsea there, and and like you said, the first year at Chelsea was you know was a little bit it was a little bit tough, but then the following year after that uh, they were champions of Division Two, which is the championship for uh, these days for anybody anybody who wasn't sure. Um, and then he, I, I believe he took him to sixth in Division One the following season as well. Um, yeah. I, it, so your dad is definitely someone who you you know you just got to look at stats and records who had a, a real winning mentality. Yeah, you're you're right. In fact, I was going to show you. There's the championship medal. 
So the oh, second. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And so um, yeah, the the interesting thing that you've got, I think, with my dad, you you can look at great managers and you look at them and you you measure them by trophies they won. But there's another bunch of managers that take clubs that are in trouble. Chelsea at the time were actually going bankrupt. They were within two days of going bankrupt. And the Ken Betts came in, said, you've got no money, you've just got to turn it around. But then after the season that they just avoided relegation to the third division, um, Ken Bates said, okay, you've got, I think it was half a million pounds to buy players. And he bought five players. And that year they they lost four games all season and won the championship. It's it's looking at, at talent. Um, I've got a, a, another funny story if you don't mind me telling you. It's it's uh, when he was at Wrexham, and on a Sunday very often, especially in the summer, we used to he used to have trials. So he had scouts along the North Wales coast, and they used to have trials on a Sunday for young young guys. Um, at Landon No Borough Football Club, he'd go there. He'd have have them come in and play a game, and he'd watch. and And him and Arvin and uh, the the scout would do that. So once one Sunday we went up there, and we we'd take the family because it's Landon No, and that was nice. And um, and my dad said to me because I played for Wrexham for eight years as well. Um, and the only reason I played for Wrexham was because my dad was manager. It wasn't because I was any good. Uh, I was okay. I was okay. Um, anyway, he uh, uh, we got to the ground. He says, look, I, I always carry my boots. He said, will you play? He says, I'm one short. Will you play? So I played and I played against the teams. And afterwards, he said, did you see anybody there? I, was, I said, there was two players which were quite good. But no, nah, not really. He, anyway, he says, there's two players there which I really fancy. And we were having dinner with my mom and my brother. And he says, he says, it's bugging me. He says, I've got to I've got to speak to these parents. So uh, it was two players who you might know, one called Joey Jones and the other one called Michael Thomas. No. So I, I actually played in the, the first trial game with Michael and Joey. And, you know, that that's history now. It's uh, and it, I've been friends with them ever since. And uh, yeah, that was that was that was really good. It was nice to do that. And the interesting thing, Michael and uh, and that's something else with Wrexham today. I don't think they have enough teams. And that might sound funny to you, but in those days, we had a B team, which played in the Welsh National League. We had a youth team. We had a reserve team. And we had a first team. So we had four teams. Today, we have a reserve team. You have a youth team. You have a ladies team. But obviously, that can't feed the the um, professional team, the the, rest, the men's team. So um, we used to play, and I played in the same team as Joey and Michael and David Smallman and Graham Whittle and... Billy Ashcroft and all those, but we played in the third team. And we were playing the Welsh National League against teams like Fly Welfare. And I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, oh, yeah, we used to play. We used to love kicking holes out of you because of it was Wrexham, you know, and you were playing at Fly, at Fly Welfare. So anyway, Joe, I, uh, we played in the youth team. We won the Welsh Youth Cup twice. Um, we got to the quarterfinals. Even, and this team was phenomenal. But anyway, it came to it that it got, they got to 18, we all got to 18 years old. And um, 10 of the 11 players were actually signed professional. One player wasn't me. No. So he came, my dad came to me and says, look, you, you, you might make a, a, an okay lower league play, but you're not there to... So I said, I think you better talk to my mom because I, I think there could be trouble here. <laughs> anyway, so... Best best advice he ever gave me, to be quite honest with you. You know, it's uh, you look back at those funny stories and and yeah, ten of those players and some of them went on to be, as I say, David Smallman, Graham Whittle, um, Michael Thomas, Joey Jones, Billy Ashcroft, phenomenal players. Alan Hill played two hundred and fifty games for Exxon. Um, phenomenal. It was great to play with them. And I went on after the players became professional. I still be, was an amateur, even through Arvin's time. And that was part time, you know. I'd train on a Tuesday and Thursday. I had a job, and I was married. And uh, we, uh, I played in the the third team or the reserves. I played a few times in the reserves and and the youth team. That is such an amazing story. Yeah, yeah, it I is great. I love that story. Some amazing players there. Yeah. Amazing players. Yeah. So talking of players, obviously, it's all all changed. 
um, obviously since the Rob and Ryan takeover. What do you think of the current team that we've got at this moment? I think the, the current team, the nucleus of the team is fantastic. I think anybody in the League One would love to have this team. I just hope that, and it's quite interesting. I, again, I do the comparisons with the the seventies and the where we actually bought, developed players through the U team because we couldn't afford to buy players, and we did were very successful. Now I think uh, Phil Parkinson he's developing players through the youth system, but he's also able to buy them. So this is a really great situation, and um, I just I, I love the players. I love what they did last year. They took the team and they tweaked it. That's all. And, and you, you can see that Phil Parkinson knows what he's doing because he knows the team was nearly there, but not quite there. Now I think he's got a team, and I shouldn't say this because I'm going to give them the kiss of death. But <laughs> that, that's, I think he's got a team and the five or six players that if there are injuries can come in. Now that's that to me is an issue also because I think he needs one or two players that are of the first team level on the bench, a, lot, a couple more, because we're seeing injuries. And if we have one or two more injuries, God forbid, we, we could be, you know, I'm not saying that Vicar staff and people like that and Waters are not good enough. I think they need a couple more seasons. In fact, I would actually put Vicar staff out on loan in the National League to give him a game day in, day out. And I think he will be a great player and then bring him back. But that's what he needs, I think, a, a couple more. And it's very difficult to get it. And that's why I think he goes for experience. You know, a lot of our players are, are quite old. And the reason he's got that is he doesn't need to actually get send people out on loan. He's got them there ready. But he's going to have to do, I think, that with a few of his younger players. So, that, and I think that will give them that that's impetus to step up to the next level. But do I think they can win the get promotion this year? Absolutely. Good. Yes. I think I think we're all of that. I think at the moment I think we've hit our stride. Yeah. We're looking good and I, I yeah, I I truly believe we're going to be are we going to be champions? I'm not sure about that. Um uh, but you know, we've got it's not the National League anymore. We've got top three. Mm. And I think we are definitely good enough to be in that in that top three. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us. Are you OK to hang around for the quiz? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Looking forward to it. Uh, right. So we've got one game coming up this week. We do. Who? Morecambe. Morecambe. What was that accent? Uh, that's meant to be like Morecambe. But Is it? What? I don't know how they speak in Morecambe. So you've tried to do an accent that you don't know what it well, sounds like. I kind of like. know because obviously we've got family who lives in Lancaster, which is not far from Morecambe. So yeah. I kind of know. but So you I, just had a guess. I had a guess. You anyway. had a guess and it's failed. Anyway, okay. so it's a um, obviously a league game again um, at home at Stoke Kairas on the 25th of November at 3pm kickoff. So it'll only be available... Or will it? Because it's still is it still the international play? No, I don't think. No, the games are back next week. So, so. it'll just be um, I follow for international fans only, UK fans, um, audio only. <laughs> well, you can listen to audio if you yeah. want. But yeah. um, so the last competitive game we had against um, Morecambe. Morecambe was in January two thousand and eight in League Two, which we drew two two away. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. Um. But the last home game was August 20, 2007, which we again won 2-1. We again won. We drew the first one. Oh, did we? Sorry. You're struggling, aren't you? I am struggling. Struggling, we, yeah. Yeah, we won. Anyway, 2-1. Yeah. Um, so we've only ever played them twice in the league. Yeah, that's... So an... this will be the third time we're playing yeah, them. Yeah, in, in our 100 and uh, almost 60 years as a club, we have only played Morecambe in one season. Um, it's home and away. So it's uh, odd that. Home and away. Anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, have you got predictions? Yeah, I think I'm going to go. After Accrington's performance, I think I'm, I think the guys are going to come back stronger. Um, I'm going to go 3-0. So, you're going to go for 3-0, mm. Wrexham. I, I think we've got to be clear about... Um, uh, Three nil Wrexham. I never ever bet against Wrexham. Don't you? No. Okay. I wish I had on Saturday, but no, I'm joking. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, they didn't play on Saturday. 
uh, more come. Yeah, their, their game was postponed. Um, they were they were due to play um, Crew, mm. uh, but it was called it was called off due to uh, international call ups. Oh. Um, they are currently ninth in League Two. Mm. Uh, they have only played sixteen games though, and they're on twenty seven points. So, uh, f as an example, if they were to win their two games in hand, they have over us. They would be level on points with us. Okay, so just to give everyone an idea of where we're at, um, uh, it, yeah, because you see teams six points behind us, they could potentially be level with us. Mm. So it's not it's not the easiest game in the world um, to look back overcome at some of the. What's your prediction? Um, I don't know. Can I go with two 0 again? <laughs> Feels lazy. I keep it does going, feel lazy. But I'm going with it. So three nil to me. Well, for my prediction, and two nil to you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Looking back at some of the their their, their most recent games, um, they lost three two to Grimsby um, mm. a couple of weeks ago on the eleventh, and they lost to Barrow as well at the end of October. Um, and beat uh, Wimbledon also at the end of October. Uh, a couple of games in between that, they l beat Lincoln 2-1 in the FA Cup, and they lost 2-1 to Blackpool in the EFL Trophy. So it's just a bit of a rundown of, of, of what they've had going on uh, recently. Top scorer? Uh, don't know who their top scorer is. No uh, idea. Someone. Right. Someone. Uh, really? Definitely someone, yeah. Definitely Keep someone. an eye out for someone. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, if I get my prediction right, um, it wouldn't matter. It won't matter because it's 2 0. So you don't need to watch out for anyone. What if I get my prediction correct? What was yours? 3 0. 3 0. Oh, we're, again, we're quite close, aren't we, with our predictions? It's fine. It is what it is. I'm still winning. But... Just before we move on to the quiz, you might have noticed as part of this video, there was a little bit of a glitch in there. Um, that's the, the reason for that is I don't know what the reason was. <laughs> It just the 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 camera just decided to stop recording and start recording again. Um, but we haven't really lost too much, so um, yeah, technology, eh, kids? <laughs> What's that? Kids, up. yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, just a quick shout out for Dragon Chat. It's a mental health peer support group. Uh, they run a weekly Zoom call from 7pm till 8.30. Best thing to do for that is follow Dragon Chat Steve Lloyd on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, highly recommended to do that. Anyone wants to get in touch, get in touch on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or email us at me, the wife, and rexamafc at gmail.com. So it is quiz time. Excited? Oh, best time of the week. David, are you still there? I'm still here. Still here, still there. Right, okay. Are you ready? Yeah, is this... So this is, for anybody who's watching for the first time, uh, this is two lies, one truth. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to read out three statements. Two of them are lies made up in my head, and uh, the one of them is the truth. And all David and Sean have to do is pick out the truth. Um, I will Which come... is harder than it looks. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll come to Sean first, so mm -hmm. she can't steal answers, as we've said in the past, and then we'll go to David for an answer. Okay, let's so do it. let's go. First one: Wrexham released a champions book this week, uh, detailing the title-winning 22-23 season. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number one: the book is priced at ten pounds. Number two. The foreword of the book is written by Mickey Thomas. Or number three, the book is a limited edition release with only 1,500 copies available. Ooh, I'm going to go with one. Number one? Yeah. David? Number two. You're going to go with number two. Yeah. Sean, you are correct. Yeah. It is number one. It's only priced at £10. I didn't think anyone would go for that because... Oh. The Wrexham stuff is usually a little bit more expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Uh, second one. Jacob Mendy started on the bench for Gambia on Friday. He didn't wear his normal number 19 shirt. Jacob wore number 46. Mm -hmm. Jacob wore number 15. Mm -hmm. Or Jacob wore number 33. Well, this is just an absolute guess because I have no idea. I'm going to go with the last one. 33? Yeah. Okay. Maybe what I was going to go with 33. Yeah, number 33. You are both incorrect. Oh. It is number 15. Oh. He wore number 15 for Gambia. 
Uh, okay, so the third one. It was Anthony Ford's birthday on Thursday. You did a birthday post. I did. Yes. So he shares his birthday with Paul Scholes. Number two, he shares his birthday with Gary Neville. Or number three, he shares his birthday with Ryan Giggs. Ooh, I'm going to go with Paul Scholes. Paul Scholes, okay, yeah. David? Number one. Number one, Paul Scholes, you are both correct. It is Yay! Paul Scholes. Well done. I think that's the first one I've ever got right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, number four. Tickets for our game against New uh, Newport on December the 23rd went on sale to members this week. Mm -hmm. Number one, tickets sold out in nine minutes. Number two, the site crashed for 55 minutes before tickets could be sold. Or number three, a glitch in the system meant people were allocated a different seat to the one they selected. Do you know what? I'm going to go with B. Yeah. Purely because I was trying to get a ticket for my dad. Yes. So I'm going to go with B because it wouldn't let me do it, even though it was 10 o'clock on the dot. OK. All right, then. David? I was going to go with B as well. Yeah. OK. That's fine. You're both wrong with that <laughs> one as well. Uh, tickets actually sold out in nine minutes. You know, I was going to go for, for A, but Sean convinced me it was the <laughs> other one. <laughs> don't let Sean ever convince you of anything. No, don't. <laughs> okay, the last one. Is okay. it 1-0? 2-0. Oh, no, 2-1. Okay. 2-1, <laughs> yes. 2-1. Yes. Sorry, yes. Don't take Sorry. that away from David. I know, I know. I know. So... <laughs> Arthur Oconquo answered fan questions on the Re Wrexham Instagram account last week. Mm -hmm. He was asked, okay, so these are fan questions, okay, not your standard questions. Number one, when Elliot Lee stands next to you, do you even know he is there if you don't look down? Number two, did you go in goal because at school you were the worst outfield player? Or number three, who is taller, you or Humphrey Kerr? Oh, I really, I, I'd love to know the answer to number one, to be honest. Number so I'm going to go with number one. Okay, David? I would love it to be number one, but I'd actually go for number two. Number two. So, sean has gone one. David's gone two. The answer is number three. three. Yes, it is. So, one of the questions was, who is taller, you or Humphrey Kerr? What was the answer? The answer is Humphrey Kerr. Really? Yeah. So, he was asked that question and he said, it's Humphrey Kerr by quite a bit is what his answer was. He so, is a tall guy, to so, be fair. Yeah, so, I, yeah, God knows how much he is. Well, that was great. Uh, David, once again, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and talking about your dad. It, 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 it's been amazing. So thank you very much. No, thank you. And keep up the good work. We, as I say, my wife and I really enjoy the uh, podcast on our journeys across the state. Oh, oh that's you. brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for listening and watching again this week. And we'll see you again next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.